Tonight we are in the book of Revelation, and we're try- I've been in this, I counted the weeks the other night, and we've been in the book of Revelation for about 187 or 88 weeks. I counted a couple weeks ago, it was 185 or 84, so we're headed on towards 200 weeks in the book of Revelation, and I'm trying to be exhaustive on this. I have never taught a series uh, this long in my life, uh, and I'm trying to tie everything possible with it. There are things that are very prominent in the book of Revelation. The number seven is prominent because the number seven comes from the word oath. Seven comes from the word oath. Oath in seven, to take an oath is to make a promise to God. But you can't take an oath on yourself. Yourself, God has to cause you to do that. And of course, the word seven is the word Sheba uh, in the Hebrew. And the reason we're using the Hebrew word for seven is because Revelation is a Hebrew or a Jewish book. Uh, you've got the seven candlesticks, which are the menorah, the Jewish menorah. You've got the 24 elders in Revelation, the fourth chapter, and that's the 24 sons of Aaron by Ithamar and Eleazar. And there were 24 courses of high priests. In fact, if you look at Luke, the first chapter, John was in the eighth course of, course of Abiah, and John was a high priest of Israel, John the Baptist. And... Uh, I didn't mention that this morning when I was preaching about John the Baptist. He was in the course of Aaron. Uh, and so you got 24 elders, and that's the 24 sons of Ithamar and Eleazar. You've got, a, you've got the altar of God, and the altar, the altar was, was the, uh, you have the, the altar out here. That's, the altar was here, the brazen sea here. And the Bible speaks of the uh, the throne of God. That was the Ark of the Covenant when God would come out of the Shekinah glory cloud like you see in that picture. And he would sit on the Ark of the Covenant and rule Israel from that. And that was the throne of God. And then you had the veil here. And in the veil you had woven two cherubim. And then you also had a cherubim on each end of the Ark of the Covenant facing one another and their wings would reach out and touch the sides. So when you see four cherubim around the throne of God in the fourth chapter, it's talking about the Jewishness of Israel. Two cherubim uh, woven into the, into the uh, veil and then one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant. And when you see the throne of God in heaven, well, Israel was called the heavens and... Uh, you see the lamp stands before the throne. You see the seven lamps. And then the Bible speaks of that this lamb had seven eyes in the fifth chapter. Well, if you go back to Zechariah, the fourth chapter, the Bible says these seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord. So that's Jewish. And uh, you see the... Uh, altar of incense and that altar of incense uh, was the prayers of the saints everything in the Old Testament is a shadow New Testament is very image and I heard some famous doctor of theology teaching and he was saying oh the Old Testament was a shadow And the very image one day is when we get to heaven. No, the very image is now. It is spiritual. It's going on right here now. We are spiritual, Israel. Uh, We're circumcised of the heart. Uh, Our hearts are sprinkled instead of the Ark of the Covenant. And the law is written on fleshy tables of the heart. The Ark of the Covenant, the law was written on tables of stone and kept inside of there. And the Ark of the Covenant is sprinkled. So if you got the ark sprinkled and you got our heart sprinkled and you got the law written on tables of stone kept inside the ark and now the law is written 
on fleshy tables of the heart that's sprinkled, and our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant, and that was the throne of God, and now our hearts are His throne. So everything, Revelation is completely Jewish. And of course, I love the part that nobody understands. Of course, you can get around somebody and say, who do you think the 24 elders are? All you got to go to do is go to the 24th chapter of 1 Chronicles and it will tell you uh, who's the 144,000. I'm going, oh, good night. Have you ever stopped and read Revelation 14 and paid real close attention? And it says these 144,000 are the first fruits. Good night. Then go out and study first fruits. Well, the Bible says. Of his own will begat he us, James 1.18, that we might be a kind of first fruits. And these 144,000 are the redeemed of the earth. For some reason, they think it's somebody that's redeemed out of a special period, just out of the tribulation, but it's not all the redeemed. That's just insane, the way people think. I've gone through all of this. This is... Revelation is as Jewish as you can get. And all you have to do to find out what it's about is go over and study night and day the Old Testament for about 40 or 50 years and you'll understand Revelation is Jewish. Just, I mean, I sit back at these scholars and I'm going, they just, I, I mean, I just want to go, golly, you guys are nuts. Can't you pay any attention? just I can't even understand and when you see the glassy sea glassy sea and the it's not there's a glassy sea somewhere in heaven and we'll look out there and it's a sea made of literal glass it's made out of the kind of glass that we make our glasses out of. Glass, you know, sand, yeah, spun sand. And it's a glassy sea and we're going to go, be careful. Whoop! That's not the glassy sea. The glassy sea is the brazen sea. The brazen sea that's set right in front, a little southeast of that entrance to the temple it just astounds me I mean I've looked in the Old Testament and you know what I didn't get this from anybody I just studied the Old Testament boy if you listen to Hal Lindsay or Jack Van Wimpy or, or those guys they I'm just going you guys call yourself scholars and you have no idea what this is about and if you if you remember over there, the glassy sea, this just astounds me. i got to give you this one more time. But there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, verse 4, before the throne. Before the throne. The throne was the Ark of the Covenant. It, what before means in front of the throne. It, I think the brazen sea is front of the throne, isn't it? In the first century, they didn't have what we call mirrors uh, to, for women to go and make up and men to comb their hair and hairspray. They didn't have mirrors. It's not talking about the kind of glass that we're talking about. When John wrote this, they hadn't invented spinning the, I don't know exactly the process, but our glass is made out of sand and they hadn't invented that yet. Why would John be talking about what we call glass? Why would he be talking about it? He's not. What did they use? What did the women use for mirrors? They used brass. Some say that it was uh, copper or brass. And I remember seeing the Ten Commandments. And Moses goes in, it's probably some fiction that they wrote into it. Moses goes in to see Nefertiri. And she's primping in front of her, 
she's got this handheld brass mirror. And it's not a mirror. It's that brass. And that's what they used. And you could see her looking into it. And all she could get was kind of a semblance of a reflection. But it wasn't like a glass. She could see herself to some degree, but not like a mirror glass. So, when the reason it's called glass, he sees because of Exodus 38, 8. Exodus 38, verse 8. Exodus 38. And Moses made the labor of brass and the foot of it of brass. And it was a labor when they first came out of... It was a labor set right directly in front of the gate when they first come out. But as Israel grew and it, they became a tremendous nation, they had to make what they called the sea... And you find this in 1 Kings, the 7th chapter, where Solomon's making it. In fact, let me just show you this part in Exodus 38 and 8. And he made the labor of brass, and the foot of it of brass, and of the looking glasses of the women assembling. He told them, bring your vanity glasses which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Bring me your looking glasses. That's why it's the glassy sea. Why would John sit and say glass, and they hadn't even invented it yet? Our, what we call glass. That looking glass was something that she saw a reflection in. And then when you look at the sea... First Kings 7, here's the sea, right here, First Kings 7th chapter, verse 23, Solomon is building the temple, they have come through years in the kingdom, David had been king, Solomon before, uh, Saul before that. And then before that, they were under judges for about 300 years. And then they, before that, they were 300 years under judges before judges. And then before the judges, they were 40 years in the wilderness and then 400 years in Egypt. Well, here's Solomon building the temple. They've gotten so large, they have to have a sea instead of a laver. And it's talking about Solomon building it. Verse 23, he made a molten sea. Gosh, let me read that again in Revelation 4. And before the throne there was a sea of glass. What if I said there was a sea of brass? You understand what I'm saying? A sea of brass. A brassy sea. Because the looking glasses were made of brass... In brazen is a word that means made of brass. So this is the brassy sea. Let's read this. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it round about. And under the rim of it, round about, were knops compassing it ten in cubit, Compassing the sea round about, the knops were cast in two rows when it was cast. And it stood upon twelve oxen. It was a huge sea. If you looked at it from the side, it was like this. And the oxen was like... I can't draw. Two of them facing this, three this direction, three this direction, three this direction, and three this direction. So we're talking about the sea. That's what Revelation, the glassy sea, is about. Uh, and then he says, And it stood upon twelve oxen, three looking towards the north, three looking towards the west, three looking toward the south, three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward, and it was a handbreadth thick. It was as thick as your hand. I mean, it was made very thick. 
It was a hand breadth thick. And the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup with the flowers of the lilies. It was quite a decorative thing. And it contained 2,000 baths. And every morning, the priest would go there and bathe at the sea. And oh, by the way, this takes us back to baptism because there was a faucet on the side of the sea there, some kind of faucet. I'm going to just make it look like that. Make it look like a faucet. There was a faucet there, and they would go and wash at the sea. This washing of the sea was taken by the Pharisees when they were carried into captivity and that washing at the sea that they did every morning. All the priests would go and wash at the sea. Then they would go and offer sacrifice. After every sacrifice, they would come back to the sea after each sacrifice and wash their hands and their feet. Well, that's where the foot washing comes from. When Jesus washed Peter's feet and he was illustrating the most menial job in a household and he was also illustrating what they did from the sea and they took the washing of the hands, the Pharisees, in their halakha, which was their verbal law where they had taken Genesis through Deuteronomy and they took in their halakha, they had a verbal law and the head rabbi would define these laws and they took this washing at the sea and they implemented the hand washing they implemented the hand washing after sacrifice because they considered sacrifice before they went to offer another sacrifice. They considered the sacrifice their meal because they would dip the flesh hook down into the altar and that's what they would have to eat that day. So before they went to another sacrifice, they would wash their hands. That's why when Jesus said in Matthew the 15th chapter, the Pharisees said, why don't your apostles wash their hands when they eat? He didn't mean, why don't they get their hands clean? They got their hands clean, but they had a ritual that's taken from the hand washing of the sea that they put in their halakha, and they would have two containers as they would walk in to partake of their meal, and they would wash their hands before they went to the altar, which was considered their meal, even if they sometimes didn't eat from the altar, so when they went, they washed their hands, and then if they did eat, they would go and eat their meal. So they put that hand washing in their halakha, and they would walk into the place they were going to eat, and they would dip their hands down. This is after their hands were clean. The hands were already clean, but they performed this ritual, or they performed this tradition. Their paradosis, which is the traditionary law, not the law of Moses, but their spin on it, and they would, the tradition was the halakha, and Jesus said to the Pharisees, What do you got people dipping their hands in water for? They took it from this. And he said, you make the word of not God of none effect by your traditions. Anybody who has a tradition, the word of God is none effect. 
And the word none effect is the word A-K-U-R-O-O, akarao. It comes from the word kurios, which is the word Lord, placing the alpha in front of kurios, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. As a negative particle, it negates the word, gives an opposite meaning, means no Lord. When you are dealing with your traditions, then God is not your Lord. If you keep Christ's Mass and Ishtar, and they're nothing but traditions, they're founded on no truth, then God's not ruling you. If you eat crackers and drink grape juice and call it communion, if you get dipped in water. And that's the big thing that's leading people away. And they took, besides going to that spigot, however it was made, and besides the washing of the hands, the first thing they did in the morning, they washed themselves all over. Washed all over. And then they took that and put that into what they call proselyte baptism. And we'll be going through that on Sunday morning in this baptism series. And proselyte baptism was a washing in water. And the Jews said in their halakha, if you're coming into Israel, you had to do three things. You had to be circumcised, washed in water that they called a new birth, and offered two turtle doves. You had to be circumcised, washed in water, and they called that a new birth. And if you're going to become a proselyte and move to Israel and start worshiping Jehovah God, you had to give up all your land, your money, and everything, and you, you were Gentile. This was for Gentiles only. And you came to Israel, and you did these three things. You were circumcised, washed in, in water. They called a new birth. And... Two turtle doves, number three. And that's called proselyte process. And proselyte baptism was Jewish. And it was taken from the washing every morning at the brazen sea. We don't dip people in water here. And it's because of these things. Now, let me... This is a Jewish book. It's just as Jewish as you can get. And if you don't study Old Testament, you're not going to understand anything. Now, we're talking about all the doctrine of the Bible, all the doctrine of the Bible. It's either false doctrine or it's true doctrine. It started in the garden. That's where it started. And I've been trying... I'm so... Sometimes I go through periods of time where I go through extreme depression because the world doesn't believe God. People won't look something right in the eye and call it what it is. Say, this is what it is. This is the truth. I was walking through... People can't recognize the truth. The true doctrine of God, true doctrine is always blunt... It's to the point. It, it's not, it never makes you feel good. It cuts to the heart. Paul was talking about certain people at, at Crete, when Titus was pastoring at Crete. He said, rebuke these men sharply. They're preaching for filthy lucre. And they're supposed to be believers. Rebuke them with cutting rebuke. People say, you shouldn't be so mean and so nasty to people. <laughs> Tell Paul and Jesus that. Tell Nehemiah that of all the men in the Bible. Tell Nehemiah that. Nehemiah, you shouldn't grab people by the beard and punch on them and threaten them just because they come out to sell on the Sabbath and God destroyed them for it. And as soon as you rebuild the city, they decide that they want to come and sell that day. And he said, God destroyed our fathers for this. I'll come down and lay hands on you. And he did. 
started yanking at their beards and pulling their hair out and just, boy, Nehemiah was a, people said, Jim Brown sure is angry. Paul said, use cutting rebuke on these people that are teaching false doctrine. True doctrine or the true prophet is going to cut you to the heart when Peter stood at Pentecost and preached. They were cut to the heart, the Bible says. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, you better repent. And Paul would preach and they'd run him out of, out of Antioch. And they ran him off over to Iconium. And they got so mad, they stayed... It took them a week to get over to Iconium and they stayed so mad all week long they stirred up the people at Iconium which is only about 70 miles away. Here he is in Antioch. They go to Iconium and these Jews at Antioch, they stir up the people at Iconium, drive him out of there. It's about 20 miles down to, to Lystra. And this is Iconium. And this is over there in the 13th chapter of Acts. And this is Antioch. And these are the cities of Galatia. And if you're going to study the book of Galatians, you need to study Acts 13 and 14 because that's what those chapters are about. And that's the whole purpose of writing the book of Galatians is over those chapters. And it's over these cities. And then... 20 miles down to Lystra, and these same guys, these same Pharisees, go to Iconium, have him driven out of there, and it's got to be several weeks later, and they go down to Lystra, and they stir up the people at Lystra and say, kill this man. And they take him outside the city and stone him and leave him for dead. He gets, he's beat up real bad. And then Paul goes on down to Derby, and then he goes back to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and he makes his way back to Jerusalem. Now, when you read 13th and 14th chapter, you can see, and that's just the beginning of Paul's ministry, and you can see how these people hate him because his words are so blunt. Truth is supposed to be blunt. It's not supposed to be nice and sweet. You can tell the difference between false doctrine and true doctrine. I keep saying this because false doctrine, false doctrine feels good to the flesh. Everybody's waiting, and I'm talking about the two beasts of Revelation. The Revelation 13, the first beast is a lion, bear, leopard, and we know exactly who that is. That is Hosea 13. Hosea 13. Daniel 7. That is the Babylonian lion. Babylon lion. I go through why it's the lion. You can just believe that for right now. The Persian bear. Of course, Babylon was the most regal of all empires. And the lion is the regal animal and is always considered that way in the ancient world and then Persia was the bear of course Persia had the largest armies and the bear is the largest carnivore in the world and then Greece was the leopard and the leopard is the honed killing machine and, and even when the armies were large it was because of Alexander the Great's uh, just preciseness in his ability to articulate to an army exactly what he wanted him to do and study the enemy and overcome them. Well, then you had Greece and then Rome. And Rome was a composite of all of these. So we know if you've got that same beast in Daniel 7, Hosea 13, when you get to Revelation 13, that that lion, bear, and leopard is the same system. It's not a man, it's a system. Everybody's waiting for a man to come on the scene. And this is the thing. People cannot recognize the beast because they're looking for a future thing and the beast has been here since the Garden of Eden. 
false doctrine has been here since the garden. False doctrine was Satan whispering to Eve and making her feel good and say, you can have the tree. False doctrine is built 100% on the tree. That's all false doctrine is. False doctrine comforts the flesh. And there's one thing that comforts the flesh itself. And when Eve looked at the tree, Eve looked at the tree, she saw all that's in the world. This is the only false doctrine there is. There's no other false doctrine but this. She saw all in the world. Now, when you think of all that's in the world, what are you thinking of? Well, what are you thinking of? Women. That's good. That's good. Thank you. That's what Adam wanted. He wanted her. Women for men. Men think of women. Cars. Whatever satisfies the flesh. I'm talking about, give me some literal, not just some theological word like flesh. I'm talking about, what is it that we go after? Cars and houses and things and land and position and applause and, and, and adulation and being lifted up and pride and... They look at me in recognition and want everybody to look up to us and say, look at who I am and watch my talent and watch my speed and watch me go and see what all I can do. All that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, everything your eye looks and beholds, and your body goes after, and the word lust is epithumia, and that word, this is false doctrine right there. It means to long for that which is forbidden. Long for. If it's a woman you're not supposed to be having. If it's a car that you can't afford. If it's money you're never going to have because you're trying to live a godly life. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. And of course, idolatry, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. That word idolatry comes from ido and latruo. And latruo means to serve. Ido means to see. It means to serve what you look at and what you put in your eyes and your ears. Boy, we're all guilty of that, aren't we? Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. John said, 1 John, 14, 15, uh, 1 John 2, starting in verse 15 through 17. He tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all, everything, everything, I will never get tired of talking about this. Everything that man goes after the flesh, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that was in the tree. That is the doctrine of the devil. Eve saw a tree that was good for food. It would fulfill the lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eye. It would fulfill the lust of her eye. It would make her wise, and she could be proud with her own conceited attitude that is the false doctrine, whatever fulfills the flesh. True doctrine crucifies the flesh. Any preacher that does not tell you to take your cross and die daily. I was in a restaurant this past week. And this little black girl, not little, I mean 28 or 30. And she saw my T-shirt and she said, what's on your shirt? Friends of the world are enemies of God. I said, that's what the Bible says, James 4 and 4. Whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. She went, whoa. And I said, she said, can I see what's on the back of it? And it said, take your cross and die daily or go to hell, Luke 9, 23. And she, I said... The Bible says you must take your cross and die daily or you cannot be a disciple of Jesus. And she did one of those little black steps I think they did in the church. She went, whoa. 
my bed. <laughs> it was kind of funny. It's like she did a twirl. I don't know. I've seen it done when they do it on TV. I'm going, that's not the response. And I got real straight with her. See, people are not used to that. She's used to feeling good. And it was like, man, she got real big eyed and going, oh, I don't understand this. I was, I'm trying to show you where America is. I was down at Lowe's this past week and I'd, I'd been working out in the yard and I had my jeans on and they were filthy, dirty and I had some old beat up shoes on and I had a, and I had a just a t-shirt and I was just <laughs> haggard looking. My hair was... <sighs> and this guy saw me from a distance. He said, I watch you on TV all the time. Man, he said, now this is what gets me. He said, I've never heard anybody like you. He said, I had some questions, and I told somebody, if that guy Jim Brown don't have the answers, I don't think anybody has the answers. And I'm not saying that at most. I'm just saying that's what he said to me. And so I started preaching to him. I, I started talking about daily cross and death to self. He said, well, I go to such and such Baptist church. I said, and I said, well, you're the one that said you like this truth. Does your preacher preach Christmas is pagan. Oh, yeah. No, he doesn't. I just want to say you're lying. Then I said, does he preach predestination? He said, well, I don't think he preaches that. I said, and he's lying to you, and he's not telling you the truth. There is no sinner's prayer. There is no accept Christ. And I went to the verses. Uh, we know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he may heareth. And I went through Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that's not the method of salvation. The Bible says, How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And then I said, What about the Philippian jailer in Acts 16? When he came and fell down at Paul and Silas' feet at midnight, I said, He fell down at his feet and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Didn't Paul say... Believe. He didn't say, would you like to accept Christ? Would you like to pray this sinner's prayer? I said, he said, believe. And the guy, it like it struck him, he kind of went, believe. That's it, isn't it? Believe. I said, that's it. But I said, you have to understand, belief to them wasn't our definition of belief. To them, it meant to obey. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith and believe are the same word, I told him. And I kept talking. I said, these preachers are not telling the truth. I know the Baptists. I was raised in their churches. I was raised in a Baptist preacher's home. And I was ordained in a Baptist church myself and preached in hundreds of Baptist churches across America. I said, they don't believe the truth. I said, Billy Graham doesn't believe the truth. He said, but Billy Graham is a good man. I said, no, he's not. I said, he doesn't tell the truth. He talks about accept Christ. Pray the sinner's prayer. And he said, oh. I said, now I want you to understand what I just said. I said, I didn't say Billy Graham wasn't a nice guy. I said he didn't tell the truth. And he said, oh, oh, yeah, he is a nice guy, isn't he? I said, yeah, but he lies. And I said, nice is a French word, and he's scared. N-I-S-C-E-R-E, -E, and I said it comes from nay, and scare. Nay means no, scare means knowledge. I said, nisker, nice, means to pretend. When you act nice, you play dumb, and you act like you're dumb, and you don't know what's going on. Billy Graham acts like he doesn't even know predestinations in the Bible. He acts like he's never heard that Christmas is pagan and he acts like there's a whole lot of acting there, isn't there? Well, what do you call an actor? Hippocrates was a stage actor in the first century and they wore a mask. That's our word hypocrite. Comes from hupo meaning under and kretes means judge. It means an inferior judge, and a judge was one who interpreted the law, and these are interpreters of a role. Billy acts like he doesn't hardly have any sin. 
Well, he don't have any sin. Ah, Billy Graham couldn't have any sin. Well, yes, he does. You know how I know? I admit what's in my heart. And if you admit what's in your heart and you confess your sin, you know everybody else has it in their heart because there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to all men. Now, you don't want to come around me because I can see through you. (laughs) When you start admitting what's in your heart, you can look right through somebody. When they're putting on, you're going, hey, that's wrong. Stop that. Get that look off your face. Quit acting that way. Quit playing dumb. Do y'all know that there's no such thing as a dumb person in the world that's got any kind of average IQ? Nobody is that stupid that preachers look like they are. Like, I'm just a wonderful, godly man. I know nothing about sin. Like that lame-brained Baptist preacher here in town. He pastored one of the biggest Baptist churches in Sumner County for years. He stood in his pulpit. Real nice guy. He joked a lot if you went to a party with him somewhere. And he stood in the pulpit and said, Liquor has never passed these lips. You smart, ailey, cocky, arrogant devil. You'll go to hell for being that proud. Oh, you don't have any sin. What foolishness. Let's see how nice Billy Graham is. Boy, do I have information on him. Here's a book called Smoke Screens. Here's a book called All Roads Lead to Rome. And here's an extremely complicated book. Billy Graham and His Friends. That is a thick book. And that takes you into all of his life and his world, his politics, who he puts his approval on. And some of the things in this book will shock your socks off, what he puts his approval on. This is one of my favorite indictments of Billy Graham here, smoke screens. I'm trying to tell you that people can't see the truth. If I'm telling the truth, Billy Graham is lying through his teeth. Let me tell you something. I've been thinking about this this week. When a man preaches the truth, the further away from the truth, let me pull this over here. A man's preaching the truth. And the Bible says we are to mark them. Scopeo, point them out. Scopeo. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses that are contrary. Now, I've used this word before, but let me show you something here. That are contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned and avoid these people. Stay away from them if they have a doctrine that's contrary. Now, contrary means, it's the word para. It means parallel. We get our word parallel. A contrary doctrine is not a doctrine on the other end of the universe. It has the same terminology. It has born again and saved and salvation. And it's added a lot of things like accept Christ and sinner's prayer and all of this. Contrary means near. In fact, the word para... Para kaleo. Kaleo means to call. We see kaleo in ecclesia. Ecclesia is the word church, which is the word ek, e k k l e s i a. It comes from ek, meaning out. We get our word exit from that. And kaleo. Kaleo means to uh, means to call. So church means to call out of this world to live righteously. The word parakaleo is the word comfort. It means to call near. You call someone near when you comfort them. Well, this word para is used in many applications. Para means near. When someone has a doctrine that's near... But it's not exactly on. 
Let me say this real clear. The, the further your parallel doctrine is away from the truth, the less deceptive it is. The closer it gets to the truth with never getting right on the truth, let me put it this way. The closer it gets to the truth with never really getting on the truth. Here's the truth. And the closer it can get, the bigger lie it is, the more deceptive it is. Let me, let me put it this way. What's really deceiving is when it's this close right here. I'm just barely staying away from it. Now that's deceptive. That is as wicked as a man can be. People complain about Oh, the drug dealers and the Satanists and they draw pentagrams and they kill chickens and wave them around their head and light a bunch of candles. That's deceiving no one. And that's not as evil as Billy Graham is or as Jerry Falwell was because they're real close. But they comfort people and they say some of the biggest lies accept Christ, sinner's prayer. It's not true. The church wasn't preaching that. Accept Christ is Roman Catholicism. When they walk down the aisle to accept the Eucharist, stick their tongue out when they raise it up in the air and say it becomes the literal body and blood of Christ. The Methodists brought that to America and they brought it out of the Church of England. When, Engl when, the, when the Church of England or the Anglican Church seceded out of Roman Catholicism. It came to America by way of the Methodists in the early 1800s. It's Roman Catholicism. Listen to this, though, about Billy Graham out of the, out of the smoke screens. After World War II, the Vatican had, had to pick and back an American champion who would be a friend, a man they would help put on a pedestal, who would be loved by everybody. Now, may I remind you, is Billy Graham loved? He's been one of the most popular men in the world over the last 50 years. Every year, just up at the top of popularity. May I remind you, two favorite verses, three favorite verses. Luke 16, 16, 16 15. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Abomination means to stink. B-D-L-U-G-M-A. B-D-E-L-U-G-D-E-L-U-G-M-A. That means to stink. Let me get real pointed with you here. You do know what a bidet is for is, don't you? It's to wash your behind. It comes from the word the legma. That's where the word bidet comes from. It means to stink. God said, if it's highly esteemed among the world, it stinks to him. James 4 and 4. Friendship with the world is enmity against God. It's enmity. Friendship. Is Billy Graham a friend of the world? Do y'all know that I dig my grave nearly each time I mention this man's name? And I told this fella down there at Lowe's, I said, Billy Graham is a nice guy, but he lies. I said, you need to come down and visit us and hear some truth. And he was ready to cut it off after he told me what a wonderful teacher I was and if anybody had the answers. I think Jim Brown has the answers. It's awful hard to look this thing right and straight in the face called Billy Graham and say, you're real popular. You're in trouble with God. If you are, 
If you are James 4 and 4, if you're friends with the world, you are an enemy of God. Friendship with the world is enmity, ekthra. It is hostile to God. Billy Graham's definitely a friend. He's been a friend of every president since the 40s except Harry Truman. Harry Truman didn't like him. He said he was a phony. And I think Harry Truman was right. I've got a picture of Billy Graham when he went to visit Harry Truman. Of course, Billy was young and very handsome, big round tone back then. And they went out on the front lawn of the White House. And this is probably why Truman didn't like him. And they knelt to pray, and Billy knelt down like a quarterback, like that. Didn't get down on his knees like this. God, we pray for this nation, but he got down like a quarterback so he could look cool, you know. Dear God, uh, we pray. Looked good. Didn't want to look too humble. Let me finish reading this. They wanted, the Catholic Church wanted to handpick a man. Billy Graham was made famous by William Randolph Hearst. You know who William Randolph Hearst was? One of the biggest Roman Catholic womanizers out in Hollywood during the 20s and 30s. Had affairs with those, with Gloria Swanson and Marion Davies and some of those old big superstars back then. And, uh, it was William Randolph Hearst. That's Patty Hearst's father, if you remember her. Huh? He, he was a big, real, big, big newspaper mogul. And he gave his newspapers, he owned a bunch of newspapers, and when he saw Billy Graham, he said, he sent the message to all of his newspapers, Puff Graham. He liked him. Why do you think that Billy Graham's been holding hands with Roman Catholicism for so long? After World War II, well, remember Luke 6, 26. Now, it's real hard to face these verses and say, this applies to Billy Graham and everybody else. If I get real popular in the world, does that apply to me? And people say, yeah, but, 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 but Billy Graham's a wonderful man. And, and, but Billy Graham is a nice guy. And, and Billy Graham loves the Lord. He loves the wrong Lord. You do not love God when you lie about His Word. Luke 6, 26. Woe unto you. O-U-A-I is the word woe. That's a cry of damnation. Woe unto you. When all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. If all the world loves you, you are in trouble. I saw Billy Graham on Johnny Carson's show one time about 20 years ago, and Johnny said, Billy, now this is what you want a pagan saying to you. Johnny said, Billy, you're the most popular man in America. You could be the president. I don't want no famous heathen star saying that to me. That means I'm going to hell. You say, are you saying Billy Graham's going to hell? I'm not saying anything. I'm telling you he's lying. Now, the Roman Catholics hunted for a man they could put on a pedestal who would be loved by everybody. God forbid that he would ever be a Martin Luther. Yeah, they didn't want a Martin Luther. He stood alone against Germany. This champion would woo and win the hearts of the American people, a biggie, a champion they would support. He could be used as the Pied Piper who would pull all the evangelicals into the arms of the Pope. And Billy Graham has done more to do that, to amalgamate Christianity into one unit Roman Catholics, Church of Christ, Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatics. They wanted a man who would be a good speaker, a man with a charisma who could pack stadiums, a man who would preach a gospel message but the, on the soft side, one who would never attack the Vatican. And so when they found him, William Randolph Hearst, a good Roman Catholic publisher, used his newspaper chain to push Billy Graham to fame. 
For 30 years, Billy Graham spoke to multitudes and became greatly loved, respected, and imitated. And when he preached, he was honored and men praised him. Yet when Jesus Christ preached, they killed him. I often read the scripture, whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. The newspapers never really blasted Billy Graham. Magazines said he was one of the world's most loved men. Somehow, I keep getting a tilt sign flashing in my mind. Uh, let me read on over here. And then they bring out, Belmont Abbey College, not Belmont Baptist College, Belmont Abbey, which is a Roman Catholic college, this was written about Billy Graham, and this was what was said about him by uh, Colbert E. Allen, OSB, Executive Vice President of Belmont Abbey College. He says, I am the one who, being acquainted with Billy Graham, invited him to speak to the fathers, the nuns, the students and invited guests, and I am pleased to reply to your inquiries. Billy Graham gave an inspiring and a theological sound address that may have been given by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. That guy was a pansy. Or any other Catholic preacher, I have followed Billy Graham's career and I must emphasize, now this is a Roman Catholic saying this of Billy Graham, one of their educators. I have followed Billy Graham's career and I must emphasize that he has been more Catholic than otherwise. Unbelievable. Knowing the tremendous influence of Billy Graham among Protestants and now the realization and acknowledgement among Catholics of his devout sincere appeal to the teachings of Christ which he alone preaches I would state that he could bring Catholics and Protestants together in a healthy ecumenic spirit how can you bring a true Protestant Protestant means to protest Catholicism and they're eating Jesus and their mass and the Christ mass I was the first Catholic to invite Billy Graham. I know he will speak at three other Catholic universities next month. I believe he will be invited by more Catholic colleges in the future than Protestant colleges. They say we love him better than the Protestants. So I am well pleased then to answer your question. Billy Graham is preaching a moral and evangelical theology most acceptable to Catholics. This is a Catholic priest. And then they show him receiving an honorary doctorate from a Catholic university. Billy Graham at, at the Belmont. Billy Graham at Roman Catholic Belmont College receiving the yoke from Rome. Graham was granted an honorary doctor's degree from this Roman Catholic college. Graham told his audience that the gospel that founded this college is the same gospel which I preach today. He was saying, I don't preach any different than the Catholic priests. Is he trying to make friends? Ah, uh, let me see here. Billy Graham began his ministry as a fundamentalist, and as time passed, he changed his position. Listen to this. In the Catholic Herald of June 3, 1966, Billy Graham is quoted as being a friend of the Jesuits in the United States. The Jesuits are the hit men of Roman Catholicism. Here's another one. Dr. Billy Graham received an honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters from the Roman Catholic College, Belmont Abbey, in 1967. Billy noted the significance of the occasion by saying that this is a time when Catholics and Protestants could meet together and greet each other as brothers. My brother is those who do the will of the Father. Jesus said, how can you be doing the will of the Father when you think you have to eat that little cookie that turns into the little body of Christ in order to go to heaven? Well, Baptists think you've got to accept Christ. I guess they're about the same, aren't they? In April 1972, Billy Graham received the International Franciscan Award in Minneapolis, 
given by the Franciscan friars for true ecumenism. Before I quote what Billy Graham said about St. Francis of Assisi, let me, first let me say this about St. Francis, and I got some comments on St. Francis myself. He believed he was saved by works, by helping the poor. This way, he believed he was saving his soul. He had to do good works in order to save his own soul. St. Francis was canonized, which means he was made a saint by the Roman Catholic institution because of his strong position on the doctrine of works for salvation. We're talking, not talking about salvation that works, or faith works. We're talking he believed he had to do good deeds to go to heaven. Beloved, we know that this is unscriptural. Did you know that St. Francis of Assisi blessed and baptized animals and gave them Christian names? Take your cat out in the creek and say, I baptize you, the Apostle Paul. And St. Francis, he took a vow of poverty because he had stolen some horses. This is my comments. He had stolen some horses from his father's barn his father put out the word that if he did not renounce all of his inheritance, he was going to have him arrested. So he renounced it, and they were running around saying that he renounced it simply because he wanted to be going to uh, uh, some monkish uh, monastery and, and uh, say that he was uh, giving up the world. Now, what did Billy Graham say about this strange fellow? He said... While I am not worthy to touch the shoelaces of St. Francis, yet this same Christ that called Francis in the 13th century also called me to be one of his servants in the 20th century. Well, they said that St. Francis of Assisi walked around about a foot above the ground, that he was that holy. That's what the Catholics said. When Billy Graham appeared on the Phil Donahue show, October 11th, 1979, in discussing Pope John Paul II's visit to the United States of America, Billy Graham said, I think the American people are looking for a leader, a moral and spiritual leader that believes something, and he, meaning the Pope, does. Well, he believed in eating Jesus' body to go to heaven. He asked the people to come to Christ Wait a minute. Let me finish reading this. And he does. He didn't mince words on a single subject. As a matter of fact, his subject in Boston was really an evangelistic address in which he asked the people to come to Christ to give their lives to Christ. You can't give your life to Christ. I said, thank God I've got somebody to quote now with some real authority. Billy said that about Pope John Paul. In the beginning, Billy Graham, well, I don't agree with this, but he says Billy Graham was used of God. But I believe Billy gave in to tremendous pressures and compromise, and he is now walking hand in hand with the whore of Babylon. A few years ago, five pastors from Mexico came to me to see me asking for help. They told me, I must talk to Billy Graham. I told them that was impossible. I was just a little track publisher. Then they told me Billy Graham had destroyed their churches. They said he had held a crusade and told all those who had received Christ to go back to their original churches and to win those people to Christ. The pastors told me their people followed Billy's instruction and all went back to the Roman Catholic system. Let me give you this one other thing then I'll stop on this. Following the New England Crusade, thousands of those who came forward are now in process of integrating into the Catholic Church. Meetings have taken place between the Graham Association and Catholic clergy for the transfer of these people to the Roman Church. One such meeting took place at Pope John Paul the 23rd Seminary in Western Massachusetts on the evening of June 9th, 1982, when the names of 2,100 inquirers were given to priests and nuns, when they walked down the aisle at the Billy Graham crusade, if they were Roman Catholic and they filled out this inquiry card, they gave it to a local priest and nun to get them to go back to the Catholic Church. That's the Billy Graham all the world respects. He lies. 
Not only that, he's got corrupt morals. Let me see here. Rome gives nothing to anybody unless you pay it off. Could it be that his final payoff was entered to introduce Pope John Paul II as the world's greatest moral leader of the world? Was that a payoff he had to make? He was giving the whore a cloak of respectability among the Protestants. I can picture the Pope smiling to himself, flying back victoriously to Rome. He knew that Billy had been a good investment. Billy admitted that he sought advice from the Vatican officials about his trip to Russia. They told him to go quietly, not to criticize the communist practices. He doesn't criticize anything. He says, I, I, don't, I just preach my gospel. It never condemns, never rebukes. When he followed their instructions, the suffering brothers and sisters rotting in Russia's prisons who got five to ten years for passing out a single gospel track were crushed when Billy announced to the world that there was religious freedom in Russia. That's very sobering, isn't it? And that's not to mention all roads lead to Rome and what they've got to say about it. And all the presidents loved Billy Graham. John F. Kennedy was a womanizer. And him and Billy Graham were best of friends. Richard Nixon liked him. And he was a crook and a liar. But they're all crooks and liars. Uh, Ronald Reagan liked him. And Ronald Reagan was a phony. A phony Christian because he didn't believe in the same Jesus I believed in. The Jesus I believed in said you have to take your cross and die daily. You ever hear Ronald Reagan saying that? And Bill Clinton liked him. They were buddies. Billy Graham and Bill Clinton were pals. In fact, when you go into Billy Graham, I just want to... Billy Graham's a nice guy, isn't he? Everybody likes him. He's friends with the world. He's popular among the world. All men speak well of him. He's God's enemy. I wouldn't trade places with him on a bed. No way. He goes into in this Billy Graham and his friends. This is real complex, and it goes into all kinds of political things. I've got something here. I'll read to you, and then I'll quit. Uh, this is pretty complex stuff. John Foster Dulles, that's the first Secretary of State I remember when I was a little kid. He was Secretary of State to Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, in, let me see if I can read this and see if you can understand it. John Foster Dulles, who dominated the Federal Council of Churches, and he was close to Billy Graham, which had been found in part by the communist Harry Ward. In fact, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was among those who helped finance the Federal Council of Churches. Dulles was involved in both the United Nations and the FCC, later renamed the National Council of Churches. It was Dulles who was instrumental in getting the FCC to support the United Nations. Skull and Bones member Archibald MacLeish wrote the UNESCO Constitution and several Freemasons helped create the organization. Uh, a fervent international MacLee strongly advocated one worldism. Dulles was former President Eisenhower's Secretary of State. I remember him. Rockefeller donated a large parcel of land for its, for its headquarters for the Federal Council of Churches. Rockefeller donated that. It was Eisenhower who laid the cornerstone for the National Council of Churches in Masonic style. Interestingly, President Eisenhower read a prayer at his inauguration in January 1953. When the copies of the prayer were checked, it was discovered that he had not mentioned the name of Jesus Christ in the entire prayer, just like in Masonry. In the Masonic Lodge, the chaplains are repeatedly told not to pray to end their prayers in the name of Jesus. By the way, the NCC or National Council of Churches just happens to be across the street from the Rockefellers Riverside Church and the two buildings are connected by an underground tunnel 
Also, Rockefellers gave a $50 million endowment to Riverside Church to symbolize the interdominational spirit and its further reconciliation of religion and science. The tympanum arching the main portal contained the figures of non-Christian religious leaders and outstanding heroes of secular history, Confucius, Moses, Hegel, Dante, Mohammed, and even the dread Darwin. Also, this church building sports stone statues of gargoyles on its cathedral, as well as statues of Merovingian King Clovis, John D. Rockefeller Jr. as a chairman of the building committee. Another famous building with gargoyles is St. John the Divine Church, one author reveals. Riverside was previously pastored by Harry Emerson Fosdick. This was the same Fosdick who was accosted by William Jennings Bryan for heresy, denying the virgin birth. Fosdick declared, of course, I do not believe in the virgin birth or in that original substitutionary doctrine of atonement. I do not know any intelligent Christian minister who does. And Billy Graham... Let me just go ahead and read this. Brian and fundamentalists tried to excommunicate Fosdick, but who do you suppose came to Fosdick's defense? None other than John Foster Dulles. Fosdick belonged to at least seven communist front groups. He claimed that Jesus was as, was as much divine as his own mother in spite of the apostasy and the leadership of the NCC, National Council of Churches, Graham visited the NCC headquarters on August 27, 1991 and remarked, there's no group of people in the world that I would rather be with right now than you all because I think of you, I pray for you, and we follow with great interest the things you do. Graham's connection to the NCC goes back to at least 1958. And this Harrison Emerson Fosdick said, who was one of the founders of this, said he didn't believe in the virgin birth, the doctrine of atonement. He did not know an intelligent Christian minister does, and Jesus was as much divine as his own mother. Is that pretty heavy stuff? What I'm trying to say to you, if you really knew the background of all these people, you would understand that Billy Graham was, is not a teacher of truth. I'm not saying this. I'm not going out after Billy Graham. I'm trying to say he's preaching a doctrine that comforts the world. That's why this Baptist I saw down at Lowe's said, well, he, he, he's a good man. And he doesn't have any idea what Billy Graham even preaches or the background behind the scenes. This book is very complex when you get into all the politics of it and all the people that Billy Graham puts his approval on. Everyone in the world likes this man. They say that for 36 years that he was on the top <coughs> of these polls of being... Let me just read this. Billy Graham is one of the best known as well as one of the best loved individuals of the 20th century. He has been in the listing of most admired men for 36 consecutive years, more than any other person. And Chuck Colson states that he is the greatest evangelist of this century, perhaps the greatest since Paul. I'm going to compare Billy Graham with Paul. And Paul preached predestination, and Billy Graham hates predestination, and Paul was against anything that was pagan, and Billy accepts everything that's pagan. What I'm trying to... In, People look at me and they say, you can't be that experienced. How do you know all these things? I traveled all over America, hundreds of churches. I preached for preachers all across the country. They're, most of them are stupid. They're dumb. They don't know nothing about the Bible. And the ones that do try to hide it. And they don't have any conviction. I was in the music business. It's corrupt. It's mafia connected from Nashville to Vegas to Los Angeles to New York. I was in real estate, associating with all kinds of attorneys and all kinds of... I was rolling with the high rollers there for a long time. And there's nothing but corruption. I thought that was milk. 
I thought there was cream on the top of the milk and it's scum on the top of the surface of the water. The world is corrupt. People don't recognize it because the world is deceived by nice faces and nice voices and people that look good. Men will not be blunt and use great plainness of speech. That's proof the apostasy is here. It's on. And I'll stand in front of any preacher in the world and say, if you don't stop, you're lying. You're going to hell. Just, I had a fellow call me and he said, Jim, I, I'm not where you are. I don't know if I'll ever be there. This, he called me years ago. He said, I, he, I, he said, I said, Ron, is this message just too hard? He said, yes, it is, Jim. It's just too hard. And I said, well, let me ask you this. If Jesus is coming next Thursday at 4 o'clock and you know it, is this message too hard? He paused a moment and he said, no. That's because he thinks he's going to live a long time on the earth without Jesus coming. And Jesus might come for you before next Thursday at 4 o'clock in a car wreck. People don't want a man who talks plain and straight. They kill Jesus for it. They kill Peter for it. They kill Paul for it. They kill Stephen and Andrew for it. They'll kill you in the world when you preach hard words. But they'll love you if you're Billy Graham. Won't they? If you're one of these popular preachers, they'll love you. I want to get back to this message that I'm preaching. I'm talking about the beast... I'm talking about the second beast and you're going to know this beast because the second beast of Revelation 13 is the false prophet system. And what I just said about Billy Graham, I'm using him. I do not have anything personal against Billy Graham. If I believed in free will, Billy Graham would be a wonderful guy to have next door to you. But I don't believe in free will. I believe that we are predestined to conform to the image of Christ. And if a man doesn't conform to the image of Christ, if he doesn't take his cross and die daily, if he does not enter in at the straight gate, if he does not agonize over his sin, if he does not deny himself, I believe a man's going to hell. But if I, believe, if I was a free willer and had no convictions at all, having nice guys living next door would be wonderful, wouldn't it? That second beast, and it all is wrapped up in this. It all goes back to that tree. What's Billy doing, doing all of this? He's letting everyone have their way. He's having them walk down the aisle. I've got a book on invitation hymns. And they did some research in this. Invitation hymns are pagan. Walking down an aisle is, is Roman Catholicism coming down to accept the Eucharist. And in this book, that they had some researchers that did research on Billy Graham. And they said it was just this little small percentage of people who walked down the aisle that continued to do something in their churches. And usually it was people that, who were already active in a Baptist church. Y'all realize that we're being deceived? And what deceives people are good looks... Smooth words, good words and fair speeches. Say, say unto us smooth things, Israel said of Isaiah. Isaiah, say smooth things to us. Don't say hard things to us. Prophesy not unto us right things. Don't tell us the right thing. Don't get blunt with us. Lie to us. Tell us what we want to hear. And that's what the preachers are doing, aren't they? They're saying what people want to hear. You ought to get these books. These are very sobering books. This is real complicated to read. It goes into all of these politics, people that Billy Graham has held hands with for the years, and all that he puts his approval on. He puts his approval on people who don't believe in the virgin birth, don't believe in resurrection, don't believe in any miracles. They're just modernist type preachers. And you know what? He's worse than they are. 
because he is nearer the truth. The closer you get to the truth without getting right on it, the better you're the best counterfeit there is. The closer they can get to the truth without death to self. The closer you, let me put it this way. If you can get this close to the truth and say, look, I'm going to get this close to the truth and here's my doctrine. Tree. If you can have the tree, just as long as you can have the tree, you can have the flesh and you don't have to die. That's the most deceptive doctrine there is. Getting as close to the truth with all the terminology without ever without ever taking the tree, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All you got to do is get as close as you can. And the man who can get the closest to the truth without getting dead on is the biggest liar in the world. He's much more of a liar than the man that's way off base. Because if you're going to lie, you want to deceive somebody, don't you? I'm trying to explain this. I keep wondering, can I get this over to the people? Now, let's get back to this beast. Because we're talking about false doctrine and this second beast. We said the first beast was a world-ruling system. And the second beast, the way you can tell that it is... Go back to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. I've spent some time on this. Revelation 13. This is how you can tell the beast. You can tell the doctrines, God's doctrine from true doctrine. God's doctrine shocks people. I mean, it shocks people when you tell them Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, predestination is true, and most of the world's going to hell. And real nice guys like Billy Graham, they're not telling the truth, they're lying because all the world likes them. And you cannot be liked by the world and be telling the truth. Well, you start saying stuff like that to people. That's why that girl did that little spin, went, whoa! When I said, if you don't bear your cross and die daily, you are no followers of Christ. And I said, if you're friends with the world, you're God's enemy. She went, whoa. Tried to do a little dance step or something. Yeah, I could tell it made her so uncomfortable she wanted to do a little spin. Now, Revelation 13. There's so much in this. I beheld another beast, verse 11 coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. He looked like Jesus. Always looks like Jesus. Billy Graham looks like Jesus, doesn't he? Huh? He's talking about a Jesus and talking about a God that'll save you, and all you have to do, it's easy. You just pray this prayer. It looks like Jesus. When I read this, I think of a verse over in 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy I mean, excuse me, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Now, we're in the apostasy. I get frustrated trying to explain. I go through all these verses, all these Greek words, but this has to register inside. In order to know the truth about the gospel and about what it says, you have to be willing... How can I put this? To go against every emotion you have, go against every prejudicial feeling you have. I know how nice Billy Graham is. I know how I know how the world likes him. I know how everybody thinks he's preaching the gospel. They think he's preaching the gospel. He says he's preaching the gospel. But what is the gospel? Gospel's the resurrection, isn't it? Well, he preaches the resurrection of Jesus one time, 
But the word resurrection, when it's commonly used in the Bible, it's the word anastasis. And anastasis means to come to life after dying, after death, and we have to die daily and take our cross daily. And that word resurrection, anastasis, is feminine gender. And anyone who preaches that the resurrection is past or a one time happening in the past, Paul says, when Hymenaeus and Phileas preached that, that ate like a canker. The word canker is the word gangrene. If you preach the resurrection is one time, the anastasis is one time, that's the only gospel there is. That is a cancerous uh, doctrine. Did Billy Graham preach that? Does he preach the gospel in believing that resurrection is every day because you got to die to the flesh every day? What he preaches is another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. That's what he preaches. It's not the Jesus I preached. People say, but you talk about Jesus and he talks about Jesus. You say the gospel and he talks about the gospel. He says the resurrection, you say resurrection. He says saved, you say saved. He says salvation, you say salvation. He says prayer, you say prayer. And he means something totally different every time he says what he says that I mean. You understand that? He don't mean what I mean when he says saved. Saved is the word sozo. It means to be taken from one point all the way to another point and to be preserved and protected the whole deliverance. You can't get that one night. He don't believe what I believe. He doesn't preach predestined to conform to the image of Christ, does he? Look here. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And it starts a list of everything that's going to be going on in the last days. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, incont uh, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. I'll stop and go through all these again one day. I'll give you all the Greek definitions. I went through it on a tape here a couple of years ago. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of of godliness. They're shaped like godly. Form, morphe. They're shaped. They look like Jesus. They look like God's word. The only thing where you can deceive somebody is you've got to get something real close to the real thing. And you can't be real popular. Isaiah wasn't popular. Jeremiah wasn't popular. Isaiah didn't have any converts. God said, Isaiah, go preach, and you'll have no converts. Now go do this. And I will keep the people from hearing. I'll give them ears they can't hear and eyes they can't see. Now go do it. Lord, how long am I going to do that? Till there is nobody left in the land till I destroy it. Now get out of here and do that, Isaiah. Yes, sir. He didn't have a coliseum full of people. Neither did Jeremiah. Everybody in Israel was trying to kill Jeremiah. Have a form of godliness, but here's what they do. Denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Get away from these people. From such, turn away. Well, if they look like they're godly, but they deny the power thereof. Here's what they do. See if Billy Graham does this. He says he preaches the gospel. I'm using him because he's the best example I know. Denying the power. I get people on the phone and I start talking to them about what we teach and I'll ask them, I won't even mention any names. I'll say, tell me this. Who is the most popular preacher in America for the last hundred years? 
A lot of people will pop it at me and go, boom, they'll say Billy Graham. Some of them will hesitate a minute and they'll say Billy Graham. And I'll say, you just indicted the man. You told me he was the most popular man, popular preacher in America over the last hundred years. Did you know that you just condemned him? They go, what, what, what are you talking about? Because he's friends with the world. All the world speaks well of him. He's God's enemy. I use Billy Graham because he's the best illustration that I know of. Does he deny the power? The word power is the word dunamis. Dunamis is the same word in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel is the dunamis. The power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the dunamis. And when they deny the power, they deny they're shaped like God. They're shaped like Jesus. But they are Naomi contradict the dunamis. They contradict the gospel. They contradict the resurrection. They don't say the resurrection isn't true. But the true resurrection is coming to life after dying. Jesus certainly rose from the dead. But does Billy Graham contradict the gospel or the resurrection? And when I preach on Billy Graham, I get more flack than you can imagine. He has got so many people that love him. He is the sacred cow of America. The world bows to him. I will tell him if I see him. Mister, if you don't change your ways and preach a gospel... They will make men hate you. You can't go to heaven when you die. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you don't have a daily cross, you can't go to heaven when you die. I wouldn't trade places with him. I wouldn't trade places wherever Jerry Falwell is today. He didn't preach this either. Without a daily resurrection and death to self, you can't go to heaven. It's not going to happen. Now, if we all have to die, and in just a few minutes stand before God, do you want Billy Graham's gospel? You want to trust on walking the aisle and accepting Christ? Or do you want to trust in God dealing with your heart, making you repent, making you realize what a worm you are? I've noticed that Billy Graham and all of these people that preach, they never tell a man what worms they are, what low life they are, how, what truly, but how's a man going to tell them that if he doesn't believe that about himself? You're not going to recognize it in anybody else if you don't believe you're that. But I know Billy Graham's that because the Bible says every man in his best state is altogether vanity. You think that includes Billy? You say, are you picking on him tonight? He's the best illustration that I know of in the world that meets the criteria of a false prophet. And he is as close to the truth as you can get and he looks better than anybody else. And he's got everybody liking him and loving him. Doesn't he? Everybody. You ought to read what these people say in this book about his friends. It's just... Huh? All the what? Oh, yeah, yeah. We used to have a saying in the music business that you're in trouble when you start believing your own press. And when you believe what men are saying, do I have any time, Mike? All right. Let's go back over here. Let's go back over here to Revelation 13. Now I keep saying, it looks like Jesus. It has two horns like a lion like a lamb, it looks like Jesus, like a lamb, it 
It has a form of godliness, but it denies the power, it denies the resurrection. It denies the gospel, which is the daily resurrection. I don't hear anyone talking about a daily cross and self-denial. And I don't hear anyone saying, if you do not deny yourself, if you don't contradict yourself and bear your cross and die daily, you can't go to heaven. Is that, have you ever heard Billy Graham say that? I'm not just, I don't, do I believe Billy Graham's the only false teacher out there? No, I believe these Baptist churches and Pentecostal churches are full of people across America. And Church of Christ are they're packed with people who are preaching a nice, sweet little gospel of their own particular denomination saying, we've got it here and we've got it right and eat this cracker and drink this grape juice and get dipped in water and you go to heaven to Church of Christ and accept Christ and pray the sinners prayer at the Baptist Church and eat the litter body and blood of Christ at the Methodist Church. Now that we're all going to heaven our own different ways, let's all hold hands. And you're not. Let me just finish this. He makes fire to come down from heaven and on earth in the sight of men. You can tell, but he deceives the world when he claims to make fire from heaven. And fire from heaven, to call fire from heaven, meant to speak truth from the mouth of the prophet. They claim to call fire from heaven, but they deceive because the gospel does not come from their mouths. The resurrection doesn't come from their mouths. The hard words doesn't come from their mouths. They claim and they speak like a dragon. Dragon is the word dracon. It means to fascinate or make people feel good. I keep emphasizing. False doctrine. False doctrine feels good. It makes the flesh feel good. Everything it says says you're okay, you're all right. And true doctrine makes you feel like the biggest worm in the world. Uh, true doctrine makes you feel worthless and unworthy and you say I don't know whether I'm saved or not I don't know that God will save me the way you preach Jim I feel like I'm going to hell only a believer will even feel those things only a person that's really seeking Christ is going to feel that and we don't give invitation hymns of grace and truth ministries we're not going to try to convince anybody of anything if this bothers you good Maybe it'll bother you all night long and bother you next week and next month and next year and year after that and year after that and decade after that. And as it bothers you through all this time, you're in good shape. When it quits bothering you, you're in bad shape. True doctrine hurts. It must hurt. When Paul preached it, it hurt. When Peter preached it, it hurt. When Jesus preached it, it hurt. So anytime... It's really hard to believe that America is this far from God. I believe that America is the most wicked nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth because it's so close. We're worse than having a nation full of serial killers. At least the elect would know who the serial killers were. They'd be guys going out and wielding a gun all day long, shooting people. We'd know who they are. We'd know to stay out of their way. But you don't know who these guys are that call themselves preachers. Because nobody wants to stand up and face the fact that if people think, this is what they think. Well, yeah, I know the Bible says that if you're friends of the world, you're an enemy of God. And that one he went on me to speak well to you. But, but that's not talking about Billy Graham. He, he's a nice guy. And it's not talking about my preacher either because he's a wonderful man of God. They always want to make excuse. They cannot say, here's the Bible. Here's my feelings about this guy. Let me throw my feelings out the window and say, here's what the Bible says. That means you, mister, and I liked you yesterday, but I can't like you today because I found out that you're not telling the truth. Let's pray. God, help us to understand, Lord, we are in the apostasy. It's hard for even us to see the truth as we sit here. Lord, I get so depressed sometimes. I want you to come, Lord Jesus. 
all the world are following these pied pipers that call themselves preachers and they're following off to this cliff into oblivion. Come, Lord Jesus, rescue us out of all this distress and despair. We'll give you praise.